Okay, so language, of course, does not sit in our brains by itself. It very much exists in the context of the rest of cognition. So now I want to discuss the question of the extent to which the neural mechanisms of language are specific to language, as opposed to maybe to some extent shared with other cognitive domains. So the question is actually a really difficult one. And before we kind of plunge ahead, I just want to ponder upon that question a little bit. So let's just assume that uh, we're interested in some neural signal that responds to language. So I'll just have that little patch of cortex represent that neural signal. And so the question we want to ask is whether this neural signal only operates on language. That's the domain specificity question. So what would you do to study that? Well, you would need to test all other types of stimuli in order to establish that uh, the neural signal only operates on language. So that's what it that's what you would need to do in order to um, demonstrate domain specificity. But of course, that's really problematic. So there could always be some stimulus type that you didn't think of or couldn't access, you can never be sure that that's not the case. So it's actually not possible to test all other types of stimuli. So this kind of tells us that this question is a particular neural signal language specific. It's a problematic way to formulate a research question. We kind of want to think about it in a slightly different way. And so this is not to say that um, uh, we should not be interested in this general question of whether the uh, neural signatures of language that we uh, discover through our research might be shared with other domains. And so, for example, in my own group's work, we've engaged in this kind of uh, uh, research. So I've told you about these MEG correlates of basic composition. So when we're just building a, a simple phrase, um, we see systematic uh, effects in the left anterior temporal lobe, in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and sometimes we've also seen correlates of that process in uh, the angular gyrus in the left hemisphere. And so we've actually created minimally uh, uh, contrasting versions of this paradigm where the input to the basic composition is not words, but rather uh, stimuli from other domains. So for example, we've investigated in investigated it in the pictorial domain and also in the number domain. So where you're just uh, combining a, a shape with a color uh, without any language or um, uh, the number cases, one in which you're adding two numbers together in a really, really simple way. And so in this work, we learned that the left anterior temporal lobe effects do not generalize to these domains. Um, in this particular study, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex effect actually did generalize to the pictorial domain, but not the number domain, and the angular gyrus effect did not generalize uh, at all. In a later study, we didn't actually replicate that ventromedial effect for the picture, so that maybe is a, a, a not so uh, reliable. So here we see that results from from the effects elicited for linguistic phrases mostly do not extend to these other examples of combination in the pictorial and number domains as exemplified by the specific versions of those tasks that were tested here. Um, and that's informative about the, uh, the underlying function of these uh, neural effects, but they don't show that the effects are language specific. These are just uh, uh, a couple of examples um, of domains or, or specific stimulus combinations that do not show similar effects. Okay, well, our brains, of course, are the way they are because of our genes. So we could ask whether it's possible to ask the domain specificity question more, intelli uh, more, uh, more coherently in the uh, genetic domain. So the question would be, do we have genetic material that only controls aspects of language? That would be the gene version of that same question. So how would we study this? So first, we would have to have some find some candidate 
genetic material in humans, because this is a question about language and language uh, really in its full fledged form exists in humans. So presumably it would be something like genetic material in which if we had a mutation or some kind of alteration, it would cause language problems. So that would be the first discovery, you would identify something like that. And once you've identified individuals that have this mutation and have some language problems, then you would go ahead and ta-da, test all other types of stimuli. But now we know that's problematic. So we can't really test all other types of stimuli. Um, and we kind of arrive at the same conclusions of this particular question. So it's something language specific. It's, it's just a problematic way to kind of uh, go about one's research program. Okay, so now having kind of established this, what I am not next going to tell you is that we actually have a developmental disorder that seems to have a genetic basis uh, that's called specific language impairment. So that sounds like exactly the thing that uh, we were uh, interested in uh, on step one on the previous slide. Okay, so what is specific language impairment? Unless you're in this field, it's possible you've never actually even heard about it. Um, so specific language impairment is a language impairment that does not have any obvious cause. So it's kind of a negative definition. So you somehow, you know, uh, a child has problems with language and there's no, no cause for it. So they haven't had, uh, you know, a brain injury and they don't have hearing loss or anything like that. And it's actually common. So the estimates are um, seven to eight percent of children uh, at the kindergarten level uh, have uh, some version of specific language impairment or SLI. So cognitive skills um, otherwise kind of need to be within normal limits in order to get this diagnosis. And like I said earlier, so can't uh, uh, show any hearing loss. So SLI or specific language impairment runs in families. So we kind of have evidence that um, it, it does have a, a genetic component, but the genetic basis in the general population, in the general SLI population is not known, okay? So there's, you know, there's still some mystery about it. Um, and in general, individuals that uh, carry this diagnosis can actually be quite heterogeneous. So it's not necessarily, you know, each SLI person is not like the other one. Um, and probably because of the heterogeneity, there have been many different hypotheses about exactly what the underlying problem is. Uh, but it's not clear whether all the research groups have really studied similar types of individuals. So, uh, for example, um, it's been hypothesized that they have underlying, the fundamental problem is, problem is one with morphology, even specific type of morphology, so verbal inflection. Um, underlying problem has been uh, hypothesized to also uh, lie in uh, just an impairment with rapid auditory processing um, and so forth. So it's actually a pretty confusing literature overall. However, in contrast to the uh, literature on the general population where we don't really know the genetic basis, there is actually one family in the UK um, in which half of the members have SLI. And in that family, the genetic basis of their SLI is known. So the affected members in that family all have a mutation in a gene that's called FOXP2. Okay. And when this was discovered, it created a lot of media attention because um, there was the possibility that this actually could be some kind of a language gene. So like I said, half of the family is affected. Here's a, a family tree of three generations from this family, uh, the shaded, uh, members are the language impaired members. So now what's immediately important to uh, note is that the gene, gene mutation that we see in the KE family is not something that is then shared with the rest of the SLI population. Um, 
it has been tested to a decent degree, but there has not been any uh, kind of uh, compelling generalization uh, from this family to the rest of the uh, population. The SLI in the K family is also not considered very typical. So they actually have uh, what seems like a more global disorder. So their deficit, that language deficit is in a sense more severe than and a lot of other SLI individuals. Here's just some uh, data from uh, a behavioral battery on this uh, family. This is some of the uh, earliest publications from 1995. Um, the point is not to read through all these tests. The point is just that the, all of these tests are ones in which they show an impairment. I've crossed out one because that is actually object naming is one in which they uh, scored not significantly differently from the unaffected members of the family. But in general, pretty much any language test, the, the affected members will be reliably worse than the non-affected members. So they're not typical. And also their problems are not just in language. So specifically, here I have a comparison or a juxtaposition between uh, some language data from the uh, family and then uh, data from a task in which they're asked to imitate oral or facial movements. And the language test is past tense production. And so here the affected members are the shaded ones and they score lower than the unaffected members. That's what we would uh, expect. Um, but then they also score lower on this kind of imitation task. So not only do they have a language deficit, but they also have um, some motor problems that you know, are not directly about language. So on the basis of that kind of data, we can already start being suspicious about this being a, a language gene. So it, does, it seems to cause problems uh, that uh, go beyond language. Uh, and we actually know that FOXP2 is also not anything like a human gene. So um, in general, it's a gene that controls the activity of other genes. And it has the, an effect on the development of many organs like the brain, heart, lungs, your digestive system. And we find it in many vertebrates. So not just ones that are kind of close to us like the gorilla or the orangutan, uh, rhesus macaque, but also in species that are quite different from us like the mouse, zebra finch, the bat. So we have lots of animal models about fox B2. The cross-species generality has offered many opportunities for studying this gene's function in ways that just wouldn't be possible in humans. Um, and that has uh, offered lots of exciting research uh, opportunities. And so here, I'm just gonna give you uh, a bit of a, a feel for the types of questions that researchers have asked. So for example, it's been investigated um, what would happen to mice if they were given the human version of FOXP2. So all these species have slightly different uh, uh, versions of FOXP2. And so what happens is that their vocalization, specifically their ultrasonic vocalization, so these are in a range that humans can't hear, uh, are altered, okay? So that feels a little languagey. Um, People have, uh, researchers have also asked what would happen if mice uh, in some sense were given SLI. So if the FOXP2 in mice was actually mutated in the way uh, that uh, the affected members in the K family uh, uh, ha ha have their FOXP2 mutated um, by nature. Um, and what's been learned is that these SLI mice um, change their behavior. So um, on, in isol when uh, uh, a healthy pup is isolated from their mother or nest, they emit these ultrasounds that then retrieve 
or that, that, that then elicit retrieval by the parents. So that's kind of like a crying baby. Um, and the SLI mice that lack a functional FOXB2 just don't produce these calls. So FOXB2 is a promising window into the evolution of speech and language. Um, we're able to study it across many species. It's clearly just one piece of an incredibly complex puzzle. Uh, it's a very interesting window. Uh, overall, we're still very far from understanding why we humans have a language, but our closest evolutionary relatives don't have anything like the full rich system that, that we do. So that's still something that hopefully we will understand one day, Lot, lots to do in that topic. Okay, so here we've learned that by a gene mutation, it's possible to lose aspects of language while retaining many other aspects of cognition. That's kind of what we learned from the K family and to extend um, from the rest of the SLI population as well, even though um, the genetic basis is not understood as well. So, that kind of makes you wonder whether the reverse could be attested. So would it be possible to lose a lot of your cognition, but kind of retain language because of a genetic disorder? Do we see the dissociation in the other direction? And there is a developmental disorder that ha kind of has that profile. That's called Williams syndrome. So Williams syndrome is a pretty general intellectual disability in which language is really good. Okay, so language kind of like uh, dissociate, dissociates from many other intellectual disabilities. It's not just language though, and I'll kind of clarify that in just a sec. Um, Williams syndrome is caused by sporadic deletion of one copy of 20 or so genes in chromosome seven. Okay, and so for Williams syndrome in the general population, uh, the genetic basis is well understood. So it's in contrast to SLI in that sense. Uh, and it's also for that reason, a kind of a less confusing literature. It's much rarer than SLI. So it affects about one in 20,000 births. Uh, no asymmetry between boys and girls. Um, and generally, uh, their IQ is low, so on like general IQ test, they will um, score lowly. Uh, but the point about the Williams syndrome is that the cognitive profile is very uneven. So here is um, uh, some language output from a teen with Williams syndrome. So this kind of allows us to appreciate um, how their language is uh -huh. Uh, very intact um, and very expressive. So this is uh, a description about an elephant. What an elephant is, it is one of the animals. And what an elephant does, it lives in the jungle. It can also live in the zoo. And what it has, it has long, great ears, fan ears, ears that can blow in the wind. It has a long trunk that can pick up grass or pick up hay. If they're in a bad mood, it can be terrible. If the elephant gets mad, it could stomp, it could charge, sometimes elf, elephants can charge and so forth. So very expressive um, language. Um, the same teen's drawing of an elephant looks like this. Okay, so now, unless you knew that that was supposed to be an elephant, you probably wouldn't be able to categorize it as an elephant. You wouldn't know that that's a description of an elephant. And so one of the really striking dissociations in Williams syndrome is the dissociation between their spatial cognition and language. So those are really, really, really different uh, in a remarkable way. Um, but um, the Will Williams syndrome strengths do not just include language, okay? So it's not just language that dissociates from the rest of their cognition. Um, on the weaknesses side, we have lots of weaknesses because it is a very general intellectual disability. So math, for example, is really street weak for them. Motor skills, 
various kinds of conservation tasks, like recognizing that, you know, uh, shape stays the same, even if orientation changes, those kinds of tasks. Uh, but then on the strength side, we have in addition to in addition to language, we have music, face recognition, and also social skills. Um, the social skills are not typical in the sense that they are actually kind of hyper social and just very uninhibited. Um, but generally that's considered um, one of their strengths as opposed to weakness. So Williams syndrome teaches us about how cognitive abilities can cluster together and it gives us some clues about how that may be genetically determined because we understand the, um, the genetic basis of this syndrome. And so now one uh, uh, very reasonable thing to do is to kind of use the Williams syndrome profile as a motivator for brain experiments. And so for example, when it comes to the relationship between language and music, we actually have a pretty sizable literature that asks the question of to what extent the especially kind of the combinatory mechanisms of language and music are similar. Say they both can be seen as having a somewhat similar kind of hierarchical structure. And there are syntactic theories that kind of make that more explicit and give us some uh, a space for hypotheses. So for example, it's been shown that violations of linguistic and musical well formedness can elicit similar ERP experiment, uh, ERP responses. So we talked about uh, the EEG literature using violation paradigms. And so that's kind of part of that literature. Um, it's also been shown that music can prime the M400 similarly to language. So if you have a, a target stimulus, stimulus that is a linguistic stimulus, you can prime it very similarly using a a musical, just a musical um, uh, excerpt versus, uh, say, an auditory sentence. Um, also, it's been shown that agrammatic Broca's aphasics can show impaired processing of musical syntax as well. So there's some cases where the kind of syntactic processing of language and syntactic processing of music uh, go together. summarize. So today, we don't have evidence that any specific neural correlate of language is uniquely linguistic. And as I argued here, in general, we can't prove that kind of thing anyway. So, uh, so we shouldn't try to say that. Um, these genetically based developmental disorders with very uneven cognitive profiles they give us clues about how cognitive skills uh, may cluster together. And so in brain experiments, what we'll want to do is to understand how specific computations may or may not accept input from multiple domains. And those kinds of data obviously then um, can inform us importantly about exactly what the underlying function of those neural signatures uh, is. So if you want, a little bit more. Um, here's a, a couple of uh, YouTube links that you can follow. The first one is probing the evolution of human language in a model organism. So that's a little bit more about FOXP2. And the other one is a, a 50 minute movie about Williams syndrome by Oliver Sacks. It's a really, really uh, wonderful movie. And so uh, I recommend it highly.